swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. My name is Graham Brown. Get ready to get some dirt in your skirt, folks, because today we're joined by an outstanding entrepreneur, author, and athlete. Check this. She became the first pro female obstacle course racer and was ranked fifth in the world at the time. She's taken on some of the sport's toughest events. Let me read them to you. Death Race, World's Toughest Mother, Survival Run in Nicaragua. She also helped found the Spartan Chick Movement with over 15,000 members today. She's written for Outside Magazine and been featured in half a dozen others. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sports business. Sports business. Sports business. Sports business. She's editor-in-chief of Mud Run Guide, named one of the 50 most influential people in OCR. And described by none other than Joe DeSena, founder of the Spartan Race, as the Amelia Earhart of Spartan Obstacle Racing. All the way from Salt Lake City, Utah, we're joined by Margaret Schlachter. Welcome to the show. Well, Graham, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. And, and the intro, wow, it's, uh, it's always fun to hear those intros. Well, you know intros. what, Margaret? <laughs> that was the longest intro I ever did. So, but I, I guess it's fitting for someone who's achieved so much. You know, just doing the research on you. You just, you must be a busy person. Uh, I think chronically, I, you know, I don't think busy. I think it's, I just, I, I am, have a passion for life learning. And like when I get on a topic or a subject or a sport or whatever, um, the stack of books or websites or whatever that get researched <laughs> before I jump into something is ridiculous. <laughs> Well, you're always learning. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to throw that back at you. You say you've got a passion for life. Well, I'm going to talk about a race which you took part in where on the website it says right there, if I get hurt, lost, or die, it's my own damn fault. I'm talking about survival run in Nicaragua. What's it like to race something like that? Um, I would say, okay, so survival run Nicaragua is probably out of, all the races I've ever done. It's the one that's deep embedded in my heart and it's a race I never finished. <laughs> I, now, I now actually work with the team uh, behind Fuego Yagua, but uh, survival run, if I have to describe it to somebody, it is a uh, ultra marathon distance running event with tasks along the way or obstacles you could say right. uh for those that watch like television it, you could say maybe it's a little bit like amazing race but way harder <laughs> um all the tasks that are developed uh around the race all have to do with the island culture of the island of Ometepe in the middle of lake nicaragua in nicaragua um so it's this it's this island that's made up of two volcanoes and then some landmass in between the two mm. um and so the, the islanders there, um, they just live their lives. And um, this race puts uh, those of us in a lot, mostly Western society, some of the islanders do it as well, but mostly us in Western society gives us a taste of their lives. Um, maybe they don't do everything that gets done in the race in one day or in the same way, but um, it's not strange to be carrying 40, 50 pounds of plantains, um, be swimming out to an Island with your flotation device is, uh, are like some gallon, empty gallon bottles of Coke or something like that. Cause right. that's what the locals use. Um, it, you know, um, carrying, cutting down 30 foot, 20, 20, 30 foot bamboo lengths and then carrying it or dragging it behind a bike or, um, you know, the year that I did it, we carried a live chicken for five miles, wow. which is ironic because I, here in Salt Lake city at my house, uh, my fiance and I live, uh, right in the city, but we have like what we'd call like a micro farm or an urban mm -hmm. farm, whatever you want to call it. Anyways, we have 12 chickens in our backyard. Um, so, so carrying a practice. chicken was, yeah, so everybody joked around it was the chicken whisperer that year because I <laughs> knew, because they're like, you, you know how to carry a chicken? I go, yeah, I have a bunch at home. This is not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite primal, though, isn't it? It's quite, the, the kind of experience is quite, it's back to the earth. I'm trying to find the right words for it, but it's sort of quite raw, isn't it? That kind of adventure race, that kind of experience. What is it about that kind of race that appeals to you? Yeah, I think what I love about it is that, 
some of the other race or some of the other events I've done, you, you know, they play mind games with you or they, you know, try to trick you with survival run. You don't know what the course is. They don't tell you. You basically are told like follow the the markers and go to the next. You know they'll be like and then in like five k or ten k or whatever, mm. you're gonna get to the next thing you're gonna have to do. Um, they give you a list of what you have to bring with you, but then otherwise there's no BS in it. They're just set. They're like the, there's gonna be time cuts along the way. If you don't make the time cut, you're out. Mm. If you can't do the task you're out, (laughs) like you know, or like, um, now they do this thing with wristbands that you collect for the tasks that you do successfully. And if you don't have the number of wristbands that are needed to get that next medal, you're, you're done because the finisher medal is a four piece medal that says I did not fail, but you get it in the order of fail. I did not. (laughs) So, so to give you an example of the year, I did it. I, got two out of the four pieces, so I have a medal that fits together that said, I fail. Right. You didn't get the knot. The knot, the most important part, right? Yeah, I didn't get the knot, and I didn't get the did. I just, I <laughs> fail. <laughs> well, let's talk about that, because I think it's quite important. You've done so many different races, and you've got such a successful career, you know, in obstacle course racing as well, that, you know, you there's this moment in the race, which you talked about off air, which I want to talk about because I think it's quite pivotal, isn't it? You you are climbing up this bamboo pole against the side of a volcano. What's going on here? Can you describe that yeah. to us? <laughs> yeah. So so we were almost, uh, I believe the race was about 70 kilometers that year, and we were almost 50 kilometers into the race. They directed us to pick up these 20-foot-long pieces of bamboo and said, go start hiking up this trail up the side of this volcano and uh the the volcano is called Madeiras on the island and it's a cloud forest volcano so it's actually dormant the other one's active um Concepcion and so I'm climbing up this volcano and then along the way they say okay well put your bamboo now up against this tree climb up into the tree and retrieve a wristband um Mm. for doing it successfully so I'm there, and I we were told we we're gonna have to be able to climb, and I was like, well, I can probably climb it, whatever, I'll, I'll be fine. I get there though, and we're into the race and whatnot, and I probably spent like 30 plus minutes trying to climb up this stupid bamboo <laughs> pole into this tree, watching like three or four other people do it successfully in the time that I'm failing it, and just kept falling and kept falling and kept falling, and just getting more and more frustrated, and then finally just cracked and um like threw a little temper tantrum basically mm. for lack of a better <laughs> for lack of a better term uh picked up like a piece of wood threw it at the woods like crouched down hands in my you know my right. head in my hands just the total which was all caught on film right exactly yeah. that's a key point isn't it because you're in the public eye whilst you're doing this you're not having a quiet moment everybody's watching hey. you Exactly. And I think it wasn't, and, and along the way too, like I didn't, something happened and I didn't know until later, but I had, uh, my calf cramped up along the way too. I actually, like one of the times I'd fallen, somehow I'd gotten this thorn or whatnot into my calf that, mm. um, talking to an Island doctor later, he said, Oh, there's probably like a little neurotoxin or something, <laughs> something in it, <laughs> which is why it automatically locked up and felt like a baseball was my calf. But, um, you know, whatever these things happen, that's part of racing. Anybody who's raced before knows things just happen. But, uh, the worst part, or not the worst, I think it's the best in hindsight. Uh, worst and best was the, so at that point I just said, I'm done. I'm done racing. Like kind of, you know, turned back around, went down to the bottom of the volcano, you know, I cried a lot probably, I think, and passed a few other racers and like, I can't believe you're out. I'm just like, I cannot do it. I cannot mm. get up this thing. I'm done. And then the next day I had to record an interview oh. um, about it, describing the whole situation and describing the whole thing and um, learned early on that if you are doing television interviews, and here's if anybody is doing a television interview, if you – are crying and you don't really want it on camera you trying to choke through talking just stop talking until you collect yourself because they can't use that footage right <laughs> but um yeah so there's so plenty I, of that footage was there yeah what? there was plenty of it and actually the um the um the guy who was head of the production's wife told me she watched it the whole thing later on and she said it was one of the hardest things she's ever had to watch so wow. um that part was difficult to do 
what was interesting though, and what I learned the most from is when I ended up watching myself and it's on YouTube. If people want to find it, you can see little short clips of me like throwing stuff, hands in the Mm. falling off. It's there. It's, it's on, it's on YouTube. It's there forever. And, um, I've embraced it. It's part of me. Um, but I, when I watched it, it was really hard to watch. And I learned that I don't, that's not part of what I want to be. Like, I don't, when you watch it now, (laughs) if you were to watch that right now, how would you feel? Now, if I were to watch it this very minute, I would just, it it brings me back and I just go, oh man, (laughs) oh man, like you, you know, that, that was, uh, 2000, early 2013 and it's not 2017. So it's long enough ago now that I'm just kind of like, oh, oh, poor you. Just, if you had just taken a few moments and and taken a few deep breaths, you could have been okay. Right. (laughs) It's okay. You know, basically would have like gave myself a hug, I think, and told myself it was okay. But Mm. yeah, it's fine. I can watch it now. Good. Do you, do you feel that that has changed you in a way or it's just kind of like, right, that's done now. That's history. Move on. Have you, have you sort of learned anything from that? Because, you know, was, well, I don't know the situation, but was that the first time you ever really quit a big race like that? Um, it wasn't the first time that I quit. Um, it was the first time I think that I got into a point. The first time I ever quit was the death race in 2012, a mm-hmm. race. It was 20 something hours in and, um, just got to the point where I really wasn't having fun. The race directors for that race are friends of mine and that race, they mess with your head. They do all these different things. And I was working out with them on like a daily basis, some of them. And I had this moment where I was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not even this like what am I doing and my now fiance he was just my boyfriend at the time was uh following me because he wanted to make a video about it and I said yeah sure and we sat down and we talked about it before I like officially quit and well I tried to officially quit and uh, he's like why are you doing this are you like and have this like was one of the first times somebody said to me like why are you doing mm. something if you're visibly not enjoying it and you're not even enjoying like the the pain and suffering of it and I really took it internally and I'm really grateful for that conversation as well. And like it, to make a very long story short, basically it was the first time in my adult, uh, first time really in my whole life that I could think of that I quit something because I wasn't enjoying myself and I just mm. didn't like what I was doing. And um, that snowballed into um, quitting my job a month <laughs> later to pursue other things. But um, but Survivor is the first time that I ever could not go any further right just could not go any further and it was a um they're they're all lessons and i actually as as we said before we started to record i was telling you i've learned way 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 more from the failures i've had in racing and i have better stories and better lessons than when i walked home saying yeah i did this or like i was on a podium or like whatever Mm. those moments are great but the failure moments are the moments that I've really kind of embraced. And I sit, you know, go home, internalize it. Like not about like, what could I have done differently? But like, what lesson can I learn from this situation? It isn't always like as quick and easy, as happy as it sounds right now. Mm. Right. There's a curve <laughs> but, that you've got to go through, right? Yeah. But, but I would say that that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Those All right, well, let's talk about that. The, death race this is 2012 right yeah go back a little bit you decided to pack that in because you just can't finish it but at the same time you've got a a senior role in education you're 27 at the time right so you know you've got a good job with a, a good educational institution and you're doing well and your family must have been proud of you et cetera. and you've got this sort of thing on the side where you're racing and you're in education, you quit this race, and that sort of snowballs into you leaving your job in education as well. Can you describe to us what was going on at the time? What sort of thought processes propelled you to do all this stuff? Yeah, so um, you know, it was in early 2012, I got an email from a company, Gaspari Nutrition at the time. They said, uh, we would like to, you know, we've seeing what you've been doing in office racing we would like to sponsor you um and i'm like oh that's great uh and at that time and i say that now like oh that's great whatever but no, it was really it was really awesome but i was already working with a couple different companies like cwx and i was talking with um uh, like innovate and a few other things and there was like gear you know giving me gear and stuff like that and then these guys came back and they're like no we want to 
pay you like uh-huh. a monthly salary stipend or whatever you want to call it to be on our team. And what was crazy at that time, like the people who were on the team were like Ronda Rousey and I were on the same pro team together that only had like 15 people. So it was, you know, it it was, it was a real honor and stuff. But so that kind of happened. And then at the same time, one of my good friends, she quit her job. She was um, editor at active.com. She quit her job and she and her boyfriend at the time, now husband sold everything and became, modern nomads and Mm. she's now written a couple books um and written a book about being a a nomad another friend of mine she quit her job and had a successful kickstarter campaign and uh, self-published her first book uh that i had worked with she just was like "I'm, i'm this isn't for me what i'm doing and then at the same time i read another article of a woman who quit her like six figure salary in the coupon industry of all things to gotten her Subaru with her dog and started to take pictures because she liked it. And then all of a sudden she got a few paid gigs and now she's a photographer. So it was like all these things sort of converged together. The death race happened. And it was one of those moments where it was like, I was physically fine, mentally pretty much fine. Could have kept going, went through a whole night, just wasn't into it. Like I was just like, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because everybody else wants me to do it. And I lived in the town that the race took place in. So leading up to the race, like the whole month before everybody knew I was doing the race and they're like, Oh, you're going to do so well. Oh, you're going to do so well. Mm. So by the time the race came along and I'd built this whole thing up, like I'd written about on the my website on dirt your skirt, like all the time, like I'm training for this thing. I'm training for this thing. And then by the time it came there, I was like, I don't even want to do this anymore. (laughs) So I'm in the race. I'm like, why am I doing this? And I quit. And I, I I literally ran away from Joe DeSena. Like he circle talked me into keep racing. And Mm -hmm. I got to a point. He circle talked me. I'm running up this mountain with him. I'm listening to all these people. And I'm like, wait, I can just go for a run with Joe. Any other, like at that point, any other day. And then what am I doing here? And I started to fall back a little bit, turned Mm -hmm. around and ran back. (laughs) So I say, I literally ran away from him and, um, and then I'm getting a ride back to the base, um, camp area, took a nap for a couple hours and went back and helped out with the rest of the race for the last, like, I don't know, 16 or so hours. So no, no ill will. It was just like, it was like, I'm not supposed to be racing right now. And so I guess all of those things combined, Um, led to this precipice where I got to with my job. My job is great. Um, The school I worked for is a a great school. Um, I I worked with some great people. So I'll say that all before I, um, it sounds like I'm about to, but I was being worked to death, I will say. Like I, it was not during the winter because I was a ski coach. I was head of admissions, college placement. Um, I was in the dorm as a dorm parent for a, a couple of years and I was just working like it would be no joke. I would work sometimes 21 days straight, like 12, 16 hour days every day wow. at the school. It's a small school and that's that it, it just kind of happens. And all of a sudden the time off that was supposed to happen was less and less. I was having like physical breakdowns basically during the winter season where I would get ill and uh, I didn't know that any of these things were abnormal at the time until I quit and went off and did other things. And then people are like, it's not normal for you to have your whole body shut down for like two or three days and you mm. have to stay in bed because you can't function. And I'm like, oh, that's not mm. a normal thing. Um, and it's just the nature. It was this way the school was a high pressure place. All the students there, they're all alpine ski racers, snowboard competitors. Um, That's the environment I went to high school in. So um, the kids are high pressure and the staff are high pressure. And I just got to a point where it was like I was going on this train that I didn't even, it's like I got on this train at one point and I didn't even know where I was going anymore. Like, you know, you keep following, you got to follow the chain of commands. Like I went to my undergraduate, I went to uh, a business school for uh, Babson College for strategic management and entrepreneurship, which has now served a great purpose for me. And I was six credits from my master's being done at the time in education leadership from the University of Vermont, um, which I just went back and finished last year. Took a little break. But uh, but I was, uh, you know, like everything on paper looked great. But it was like what most people didn't see was just these breakdowns. And I remember one of the women I worked with before I quit, like a month and a half before I quit, she goes, I don't 
know if this is true or not, but and I was working out a lot at that point. I was working out like twice a day pretty much before work and after work. And she was like, I feel like you're literally running from something right oh. now. And what I didn't realize, I was running from my job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was running from this career that all looked good on paper, but in reality was just killing me. So did you know where you, I know you said you were on this train and you, you didn't know where it was going. Did you know where you wanted to go or you just knew that you didn't want to go in that direction? I just knew that it was where I was going was not where I was supposed right. to be. And that's all I knew. I didn't know. And I was in a really good situation, I would say, and a really fortunate situation. Um, you know, I wasn't carrying student loans. I wasn't carrying a massive amount of debt. Um, you know, a couple months later, I moved in my fiance here in, in, in Utah. I moved from Vermont to Utah and we're in a situation that, um, our cost of living is pretty low. So I was able to make a lot of changes happen, um, pretty quickly. You know, I don't have kids, all those sort of things. But, um, basically the, I remember having a conversation with my parents before I, I quit at the weekend that it was 4th of July weekend, 2012. And I said, I'm quitting when I get back to work. And they go, okay, well, um, their biggest concerns were, how are you going to afford to, you know, pay your bills? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I have this, I'm getting paid by Gaspari to be an athlete with them. So I ran the numbers and I can, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be skimming along. Like it's going to be really tight, but I can make it work. And they said, okay, as long as you can do that. And then they said, um, you can always go back to what you're doing again. And I kind of told them that as well. I yeah. said, I can always go back. Like I'm going to give this, I'm going to see where it goes because I have an opportunity right now. And if it doesn't work out, I can always go back. And that, exactly. that's always been my, that's always been like in the back of my, you know, that, 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 that plan F or Z or whatever it is at this point. Um, there's a, there was always that. And, um, but that was 2000, that was July, 2012. And, um, it's what are we? It's uh, it's 2017 and it's it's April. I don't know when this is going to come out, but <laughs> we're five years on, yeah, yeah, and uh, I'm still doing it. So, Fantastic. but did everybody get it at the time? I mean, obviously your parents were probably a little bit surprised, but ultimately supportive. And we've got to understand that they come from a different generation, so it's probably outside of their comfort zone a little bit. But what about all the people around you that you knew? Were they all, you know, yeah, let's do this, Margaret. Or were people saying, well, you know, you shouldn't give up on your career. You're still young. You've got opportunities and so on. Yeah, I would say that um, I think I don't know if people were as, uh, you know, luckily I have, a good, I have a good network of friends and stuff. And they were all like, okay, you're doing this crazy mud run obstacle thing. We don't even understand what you're doing, but okay. Right. Okay, do whatever you want. Um I would say that the, the where I got the most criticism was from some of my coworkers, like the the head of the school. I just remember that it's the conversation. It's it's fading a little bit as the years go by, <laughs> but I remember him just being like, "This is such a bad decision. Like you are making a terrible decision." And I just remember pretty much almost everybody I worked with told me I was making a really bad decision. Wow. And uh, it, and and I get it. And, and the, the funny part, the funny part now is, is that same school has done obstacle course racing stuff as their orientation stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was a little, there was a moment of like, well, yeah, karma. okay, well, <laughs> it, it it came back around. Um, and then you know, online, the the funny thing is, is people online over the years I've learned to. Um, filter what but hmm. you know somehow came across this um this forum on this website or whatever that's like they i don't really even i think it's called like it's like get off my internet or something. i don't even know it's something like that but somehow i came across it and there was a whole thread on there about me quitting my job because i wrote a blog about it after hmm. like a week later or so after the dust kind of settled in my personal life and um <laughs> I just remember reading on there that somebody wrote that I, it was like I was making a terrible decision that I was like it was a bad choice somebody called me batshit crazy like all these things and um, I was like oh well uh, interesting I don't know who any of you are and if I do know who you are you're under a fake name right now so 
um, okay. <laughs> you know, it, but yeah, I mean, there was someone I'm like, I can't believe somebody's calling me crazy online. Right, right. But, how do you, how do you deal with that? Cause I mean, you are tough, right? And there's no doubt about that. You, you can complete some of the compete in some of the toughest races in the world. We know that. So, but, when you hear those kind of things and you're at a time where maybe you're a bit more vulnerable because you're coming out of one, you know, part of your life and you're starting something new and everything's changing and you're maybe a little bit unsure when you hear those kind of things, do they affect you or you just think, yeah, whatever, move on. Or do they sort of still sit there in the back of your head when you're doing your races and you're thinking, well, maybe they were right. So I would say that in, um, 2011 when I started so I started during your skirt in 2011 and in 2012 and 2013 well, I would say that it was um yeah I would internalize a lot of those a lot more um at first than I do now um my book came out in 2014 and I'll tell you what if you want to grow a thick skin write a book right. because I have never had to see <laughs> as much criticism good and bad um you know um about a piece of work that i put out and uh you know, i have kudos to anybody who writes a book i don't care how many typos are in there i don't care how poorly they say it's written i know how much effort puts into even the crappiest book out there hmm. so um this, this is obstacle race training book right how to let's yes. give it a plug how to be any course compete like a champion and change your life right that's the book that you put out there yeah yeah right. and in the they are the crazy part about that and i think that anybody since this is an entrepreneur podcast is that when you make a big change like like when i quit my job and it's funny because when i did it at the time it didn't seem it all just kind of seemed like okay this is what i'm gonna do next hmm. when i look back now like five years later i'm like what the heck was i thinking thinking like not in a, well, like I'm, I'm i'm happy where i am now but i'm like wow the like cojones to, <laughs> <laughs> to do that like whoa um it, yeah so um looking back it, it like it didn't seem like a big thing when i did yeah. it now i'm like whoa that was a, a, a bit a bit bolder move than maybe i thought at the time um but the the uh, the kind of and I think that we all have these signs from like the cosmos or whatever you believe in that sort of these signals that say like hey you're doing the right thing mm. is that the day or so after I quit my job officially like the email sent all that sort of stuff I got a blind email through my website that said do you want to turn your website into a book and this was from my original editor Bud Sperry at Tuttle Publishing, um, my editor changed halfway through the book process, but um, he was the original one and just emailed me out of the blue. And this is the like the day after pretty much I've talked to and I've been told like you're making a bad decision, all this sort mm. of stuff. And you get this email and you're like, oh, wow. well, maybe this, maybe this is the universe telling me this is, this was the right thing to do. But, exactly. um, but, but yeah, maybe that snowballed into three, three months I had to write a book. And so... <laughs> I don't think that would be something that would phase you, right? You've done tougher challenges. Um, I didn't sleep a lot. In those couple of months. <laughs> well, you, yeah, I would wake you weren't up sleeping like, a lot anyway, right? Up to that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I would wake up at like two in the morning and, and write until like six in the morning, and then go back to bed for a couple hours. Right. It was weird stuff was going on. <laughs> so, you know, the interesting thing about what you were doing. And I think we have to put this into a context. You were riding for what was quite a new sport at the time, obstacle racing, right? You know, it was kind of an emerging sport. So that was a new thing. And then on top of that, you're a woman in that, mm -hmm. you know, and there was, you were the first pro, tri, uh, sorry, first pro athlete in that field, right? So that was mm -hmm. something else that you were breaking ground with. And you're also a woman entrepreneur. So I guess, you know, it was kind of, you're putting yourself really out there and I don't know if anybody, everybody would have got that. And I'm wondering how they sort of received your book. You know, there's this woman, what does she think she's doing? You know, being a, a pro in this field, in this sport, this is not a proper sport or, you know, women can't do this or whatever it is. You know, what kind of response did you get? Let's talk about, let's get the critics out of the way first because then I think it's really important to talk about who we should give the airtime to and that's the people that count, the people that love what you do, right? Yeah, for Let, sure. Let's start with the critics first. How did they receive that? 
Um, yeah, I, mean, I would say that over the years, I, I think that overwhelmingly, I have to say that ops racing has been a super supportive industry. Now there are critics and there are trolls and um, I've dealt with them. And I think pretty much anybody who puts themselves out there into the world and puts their creativity out there, whether it be writing, art, whatever, when you put an expression of yourself out there, um, you're inviting in the good, but you're also inviting in the bad. And um, you kind of just have to learn how to navigate mm. the um, when the criticism comes. And I, I actually, you know, I, I've listened to um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and somebody that it's, it's always fun to listen to is like Joe Rogan yeah. always talks about he will have a, a different guests on and then those guests will be on other podcasts or whatever. And they'll say like, oh, you know, somebody said something bad about me on Twitter or whatever. And Joe says like, who cares? Exactly. Who I love cares? Joe. I think he's like, fantastic. He's great. I mean, I, I think we can all take a, you know, take a, a piece from that is that it's like sometimes people have constructive criticism and that's great. And it's great to then kind of learn from that and then um, make changes, change your business, change your, you know, how you're presenting yourself or maybe somebody, you know, and when they give you a good piece of criticism that's like, oh, well, maybe I didn't look at it that yeah. way or I didn't see how it would be perceived that way. Um, but then there's just the other ones that are just like, <laughs> like they just, you know, they just attack for whatever, yeah, for whatever reason. You can't reason. do anything right in their eyes, right? That's yeah, the, or so. like you did something one time that pissed them off and now they're just going to try to discredit you wherever exactly. you are. And I the more that you give them, and I actually read, there's a great book about, um, about public shaming and all that is, um, so you've been publicly shamed by John Ronson. And I think every entrepreneur should read that book. Hmm. Um, and then Monica Lewinsky gave a great Ted talk as well. Um, in the last like couple of years. And that's great. She talks about how she was pretty much one of the first like trolled people. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but y you just, what I've kind of learned is that, you focus on the positive sides of things. And like I, when I have one person that trolled me for almost a year, just not terribly, not as terrible as I've seen a lot of other people I know, but um, just would get in, like somebody would share an article I wrote and that person would get in and like try to discredit me every time. It was like exhausting. Yeah. And, I, and I let it get into my mind time a lot. And um, what was interesting is that like this guy wasn't totally anonymous. Like he was friends with friends of mine. Right. <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, you know what I eventually did? And I don't, I don't know, maybe this is a little too woo woo for a lot of people. I wrote a cosmic letter to the person and apologized. I don't, I didn't really know what I was apologizing. And somebody's like, you had nothing to apologize for, but I just apologized to him and wrote a letter of, from a place of empathy and compassion. And I think mm. I ended up flipping the switch on like when I get a lot of, when I get trolley type people, I try to, instead of going, why are they attacking me? I, I, and I, I got this from somebody else. This isn't my own thing, but instead of why are they attacking me? I, I look at it now as what's going on in their life. Exactly. That's causing them to feel this way. Why? Like what, what in their life is triggering this emotional you know, yeah. outpour. And then honestly, why do you, I don't have time for that. Like, how do you have the time yeah. to, to, um, and then there's also a great, this American life podcast, uh, ep or episode that they talk about, um, trolling the whole episode. And one journalist, this female, um, actually talks to her troll hmm. that created a fake Twitter account of, uh, um, of her dead father. Wow. It's, bad yeah um and they actually talk on the radio program together about it and he, he like he talks about where he was in his life and why he's trying i think that episode's called like if you have nothing to say say it all in caps i think that's the name of that episode wow. for people if they want to check that you out put that in the show notes that's amazing yeah you really put yourself out there margaret i mean i think that takes an enormous amount of courage not just in terms of being a pioneer and all the different things that you do but also like that episode with the troll you know, the way you chose to deal with it, I think that is something that I could learn from and people could learn from as well because, okay, well, maybe, you know, you should have just ignored them or whatever, but that probably wouldn't have solved the problem. And at the end of the day, it's a win-win, right? They go away. 
you yeah, the, feel better the, about it and they feel better and, about it. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is that that particular person and individual, um, the two of us have actually gotten to know each other now. Wow. And we, we have, I have no, I, there's no ill will, none. And, yeah. and, you know, I have to say too, throughout this whole thing is that I have a partner in life that if I start to internalize something, he'll be like, why? It's yeah. just taking your mind time. Let's switch it to something else. And he, like, he's a good balancer for me. I'll be like, why are you putting your mind time to this thing or this person or you right. know whatever? Um, and he'll be like, come on, let's let's like go in our garden. Let's go for a hike. Let's go do something Re reset else. button. That's actually for productive in life instead yeah. of sitting here and like festering in this exactly. this pool of muck trolling. Well, let's talk yeah. about. I mean, exactly. Let's talk about the positive because I, I think the real positive of what you do. Um, I, I love what you do with dirt in your skirt and the podcast because that's sort of really like the the flip side of that is that you know. I'm a great believer, like Seth Godin says, you know, don't sell to the unsold, sell to the sold. And you're sold to the people who really get what you do. And with Dirt in Your Skirt, you are sharing the stories of people like yourself, women who are doing these kind of, well, I use the word crazy, but in a very positive way, because I think it's sort of a, you know, people have stepped outside the comfort zone and doing these obstacle course races or whatever it is these, these amazing challenges or people who faced up to you know who overcome significant adversity in their life and done some amazing things so in a way you know you're surrounding yourself with people who get that now right you know rather than people who need to be see the evidence need to see the facts need to be justified to and, and so on so tell us a little bit about that project why you started it and you know what it's done for you yeah, so, so I started the website in 2011, and uh, I think it was about May or June 2011. Um, Facebook like tells me when it when I started. <laughs> I don't even remember. You know, um, so I started. Or I could go look on the website, but um, I started it in spring 2011, and um, you know, I, early on, I came up with three words that kind of. Um, it was really it was all about me website for a long time, and then you know started cycling it not so much about me more about the industry and stuff and um it was highlighting women in written articles but um love the podcasting medium as i tell people um i listened to podcasts back in 2005 when i drove across the country for the first time that was i think 2005 2006 that that was like when i first started listening to podcasts so one of my favorite podcasts was more hip than hippie which doesn't even exist anymore um but was like a green podcast before everything was green mm. <laughs> um so i love podcasting and um with the website i came up with these three actually i ran a contest early on about like um like describe what you think this website is to to people and this is before i really even had a mission statement and uh, i came back with a lot of different things and my favorite that somebody submitted and then it just, I kind of built everything off of that were three words. It's, ex it's explore, conquer, inspire. And so to, to put that out a little bit more, it's explore new things. And I keep things as very broad because it doesn't matter what you're exploring, but whether it's like internally, externally sports, whatever. Um, and then uh, it conquer the conquer is conquer old fears and just get over the old stuff and then inspire is just kind of, you know, inspire those around you, but through your actions, like don't tell me you're inspirational, just go out and do something. And like, you're going to inspire other people around you. And that's kind of, kind of where everything, the Genesis came from. So when I made the podcast, um, I just wanted to get into podcasting, something I'd wanted to do for a long time. And, um, I work pretty much full, uh, yeah, I work, work full time for Mud Run Guide and I do obstacle racing kind of full time now on the media side and whatnot and don't really compete competitively anymore. Um, go out and compete for fun now. But uh, that was, you know, th that was taking up pretty much 90% of my time and Dirt in Your Skirt was not, I don't want to say it was dying, but it was, it was, it was an uncared for 
um, you know, tree that was sort of, that was sort of like, hello, I'm over here. Like, and I said, you know, I've always wanted to do a podcast and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Like, why not? You know, I, I, I spoke with a few friends that have, have their own podcasts or have done podcasting and I, you know, picked their brain for a little while, read a whole lot, um, listened to some how to podcast podcasts. It's very meta. Um, (laughs) and then just did it, like, didn't really know what I was doing. And, uh, I said, you know, if I, these are people that I think are interesting and they're, they're women. I've had one male on, but that's just because I've never, I, I, I had Wim Hof on who created the Wim Hof. Oh yeah. Method. Yeah. So, I mean, there is really no other person like him. And I had just finished the 10 week course that, the that ice man? they offer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The ice man, he and I had, a um, about, I think we talked almost an hour on air and another like 20 plus minutes that is not recorded anywhere. Um, but fascinating guy. But, uh, so yeah, so I, I basically, I was like, well, I'm just going to start this podcast. I have a lot of cool, I have a lot of cool, interesting friends. I've sort of I feel like I'm a collector of interesting people around me mm. through different work environments, different travels, different places I've lived. And that if I think they're interesting, like I'm just going to start a podcast and I'll see what, what happens with it. And um, now I'm almost a year in um, and I have, I think I have almost 15 episodes that haven't been released that I sort of batch um, interview people so that, um, if I have to travel for work or whatnot, mm. I don't, I'm not like cramming it in episode. Cause as you know, it's hard to get to stay up with it all. If you get behind you, you yeah, yeah. um, so, but yeah, so, so basically, I mean the, the premise of the show is I interview women and I interview women that are kind of exploring, conquering and inspiring, and it doesn't have to be in sports. Um, I've had, a whole host of guests on. Um, I've had uh, best-selling authors on, professional athletes. Gabrielle Reese was recently on the podcast. Um, you know, I've had, um, uh, like I said, athletes. I've had people that you don't really even know. Um, I just interviewed a woman today who I did wilderness EMT training with eight plus years ago in New Hampshire, and she um, and another group were the first people they think possibly ever to backcountry ski part of Iraq this last winter. Well, you can backcountry ski Iraq. Yeah. And they're going to do a, 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 a derby rally thing there wow. this next winter in a part of Iraq. And she's skied in Afghanistan and um, she works in international development and she's lived in six different continents, but she's not somebody, she's not like an A-list celebrity or anything like yeah, that, yeah. but she's just, she's, I don't, I've always told people that everyone has a story if you know how to ask the right questions. That's so and true. that's, it's kind of what I started the, the podcast on. And now I had a professional beekeeper on, um, cause I'm a beekeeper. Wow. <laughs> you know? I, I had like, so in a lot of ways, the, the podcast is just ends up being an extension of, um, my interests in a little bit. And if I, I think they're interesting then hopefully other people well, that's cool, isn't think it? they're that's, interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always remember as a kid watching TV and you know, sometimes there'd be this guy that this is on British TV who'd come on and talk about math right? And it's the most boring subject in the world, but he was so passionate about it. You could sit there as a kid and watch it for like 30 minutes, right? And just get really into it because he would talk about math and science and stuff. And I just feel like, you know, like what you're doing is like, if you want to talk to a beekeeper, that's cool. People will be really into it if they're passionate about what they do. You know, maybe they're not into beekeeping, but I think people can really dig that whole idea of people being really into something and get into that as an idea, right? You know, and sort of oh, yeah, yeah. people are, this is somebody who's living life on their terms and doing what they want to do. And that's what I really dig. I don't want to be a beekeeper, but that gives me inspiration to do something in my life, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think one of the highlights that I had on the show as well was an early episode that's just a friend of mine here in Salt Lake. And we used to go to the same gym together. And she is a librarian by day. And then on the weekends, she competes in medieval armored combat. <laughs> I saw that one, yeah. Yeah, and she's awesome. actually on a flight as we're recording this to, oh gosh, she's some, she's going somewhere in Europe, and I should know exactly where it is, but she's going to fight like it's some giant international, right. like, na- like international tournament, like world championship tournament she's about wow. to go to right now. Oh, well, armored uh, up. So- 
all armored up, and she's just she she's she's a librarian in Murray, <laughs> Murray, Utah. You know, exactly. and, quiet uh, by day. Yeah, so well, I, people are fascinating, they and are. it's like the. And, well, I'm wondering as well, Margaret, is that you know. I find that that medium as well, and you've you've really sort of thrown yourself into it, is really sort of the opposite of we live in a world where BuzzFeed headlines, people want to click through five seconds to engage, that kind of nonsense, right? I mean, that's going to exist. That's never going to go away. But you're creating this really deep content as well, where you're sharing these stories. You're talking about people with fascinating stories and so on that people would never hear about, you know, the lady who's the librarian in armor, all that kind of stuff. How do you... Uh, measure success in that because I imagine you know if you put like a Facebook post up you get you know x number of likes it's easy to measure that right or retweets on Twitter but with podcasts you know you don't get that kind of easy you know metric that comes back and says hey yeah 20 people like this is it the sort of emails that you get and people say things to you I'm just wondering what sort of things stand out for you in terms of yeah I'm actually doing the right thing here oh, you still there still here oh there you go <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess measuring success in podcasting, I, if I'm going to be completely honest, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that the download numbers and all that sort of stuff, and mm. I'm a numbers junkie, so... Um, but are you so, happy yeah. that you don't know? Are you just going to do it anyway, and if people listen to it, that's cool, that's a bonus. Yeah, it, it, sometimes I think it'd be better if I never saw any of the numbers, even though I love numbers because I went to business school. So I'm always looking at metrics and engagements and stuff like that. But I think, you know, I get so much out of every interview. Like, I've made personal lifestyle changes because of the guests I've had on the, the podcast, because they give me a nugget. And next thing you know, it's like, Okay, well now that that brand or that I'm implementing, right. um, you know, I'll use a concrete example because concrete examples go way further than just this nebulous. Like I've implemented so many things. Um, so I interviewed Katie Bowman, who is a biomechanist and a movement ecologist. She is fascinating. She's written like nine books. Um, I'm currently sitting on a chair right now, and I'm kind of regressing a little bit back to more chair sitting. But she doesn't have any furniture in her house. Like her kids, like she has furniture, like her dining room table is just cut down. So they sit on like cushions on the floor hmm. because 50% of the world lives, like eats, sleeps on the floor. That's not an abnormal thing. It's only in Western society that we think it's abnormal. So she changed the paradigm for me between exercise and movement. And, was, and we talked about how you can be an exerciser and go to the gym like an hour a day or whatever you do or go for your run in the morning and then you go sit at work all day and then you go home from work and then you sit on the couch and then you go to bed and you never and you're only moving then really for an hour a day and so she's talked she talked really changed the paradigm for me between being a mover and an exerciser <laughs> so so I try to move more so now like I will um the post office is an hour or is a mile and a half, I think, from my house. So unless I have so much that I can't carry it all, I just because um, I sell spear kits, which is a whole nother story on my website, right. which are part of the Spartan Race, and I've been doing that since 2012. So I ship those out, but I'll be I'll go and instead of um, driving to the post office and back, I'll go walk to the post office and back stop at like the grocery store on the way back, pick up some stuff, like carry a backpack or whatever. And, um, then take my phone calls on the, on the go. Mm. And I get three miles of walking and I get sun and I get my chore and I get errands done and it's all in one trip. And so she taught me that. And now I, you know, and she calls it stacking. So that's just one, that's one really, you know, you know, exact example of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of something I've taken away from a guest. But I would say pretty much every single episode, I take something away. Yeah. That's amazing advice as well. It's great advice and all the better for it as well. I think we really realize how, you know, even if we are hard exercises, how much of a sedentary life we really do lead, you know, sitting at the office in front of the computer screen and so on. So it's great to do a podcast like that because you're getting all this kind of coaching, if you like, for free, right, from these inspiring people. I think that's great. 
Yeah, I always tell people I get to talk to people that if I um, had to hire them, yeah. <laughs> it would be it would be way out of a range that I could afford to pay for like an hour of their time. And then I get an hour of their time or more, you know, or more. And then a lot of times, you know, as you and I did, we get the the little nugget of time before and after um, when the record button's off and there's indispensable information I've yeah, gotten exactly. from guests. Well, it's great. I love what you do. And I think a lot of people, you know, listening to this podcast would be inspired to go and check out your podcast as well as your website give them the links in a minute but just finishing up i want to finish with something that you have written yourself margaret and i want you to sort of tell us a little bit about this especially in the context of people who may be looking at your life and what you've achieved and saying yeah i want to do that or i want to do at least a little bit of that right because i want to you know maybe they're staring outside the office window right here right now thinking yeah i want to make some change and you wrote life is about taking chances getting to the core of ourselves and finding out we are greater than we ever thought we could be. That's a great quote. Wow. Oh, wow. You that's, wrote that. I, I, thanks for pulling that <laughs> yeah, out. No, that's that's a that. great, that's a great quote. Wow. I wonder who wrote that. <laughs> sometimes, you know, I, I will say that when right. I write sometimes and anybody that writes, um, there's a thing that's called the flow state that when I get into writing sometimes I have absolutely no idea what I'm writing. Like it, that came from the flow. That's state, a flow sure. state quote right there. Um, so yeah. if it were 2012 and you were talking to me and you said, if somebody wants to do this, what are you doing? Go for it. Do it a hundred percent right now. That's it. Go do it. Okay. 2017, I'm a little bit, I've been through the highs, I've been through the lows. We didn't really talk about the lows, but they're definitely, as everybody that has ever tried to do something that's off the beaten path, a, a lot of nights where you wake up and you go, what am I doing? What is going on here? Should I just go back? You know, And I've honestly almost, I have applied to, I think, three or four different jobs to go back into like different, like more quote unquote regular jobs um, in the last five years. And then every time I get to the precipice of, I've been like the last candidate basically, like within so like myself or one other person and every time I've bowed out. Um, so I will say that it's not like a, direct everything is great everything is happy 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 joy joy the whole time um so what i would say though is if people are, are are wanting to make a change in their life um i'm a little bit more cautious i would say maybe it's just going to be a little bit older i'm almost 34 versus 27 um is that it, look at what you have as responsibilities in your life first you know like if you have a spouse kids a mortgage I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying um, there's more responsibility there. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. I, I know there's more responsibility. So I'd say still do do it. But if you want to do something and you really want to do it, find you'll find a way to do it. And um, like, and if it's meant to be for you, the universe is gonna you know throw you a bone at some point. Um, I read something just the other day that it said like somebody this this mess, this thing that this person wanted this red Prius. Mm. So all they wanted was this red Prius for whatever reason. And, um, the universe that somebody then said to them, Oh, I have this, uh, like a couple months later, it's like, Oh, I have this red bike that I'm getting rid of. Like, right. do you, um, do you want it? And the, uh, in the thing it said, well, what did you actually want? Like when you said you wanted a red Prius, what did you actually want? You wanted something that was, um, fuel efficient, uh, reliable, safe, that'll get you from point A to B. That red bicycle is reliable, safe. It's going to get you from point A to B. So the universe doesn't always manifest things in the way we think they are, <laughs> you know? Um, but then again, like if you want to try to go do like an athletic event, I'm going to say like, if you want to do like an, an obstacle race or you want to do you know, I just did my first adventure race and like right now I'm getting into mountain biking for the first time in my life. And, um, if you want to do those things, like you can go ahead and do those. Those are low risk activities. I would say that you can go ahead and do, um, if you're looking, if you're in a job that you absolutely know is not your path, um, but you do have that family and you do have all those things, 
start to look at ways that you can creatively change your situation um, and but how it's going to affect the rest of your family. Because you can't just, if you have those responsibilities, you can't just be like, I just quit my job and now I'm going to go live on like poverty. That's like, maybe that'll work for your family, but most families that probably wouldn't work for. So um, what I say now, it's a high risk thing. And I'm not saying don't take the risk, but I'm just saying that um, look at all the options and maybe Maybe you wanted that red Prius, and you, you when you focus only on that red Prius, you're going to miss the red bicycle. And so, you know, maybe even within a company that you work for, if if maybe there's a project that comes up that you're like, I really want to work on that. I don't know if my skill set's there. You know, why don't you go after it? You're already working at that place. You're already doing that thing. So, um, it's small steps, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that creates much bigger change in the long term. And that whole thing, I mean, the red Prius example is a good one because it, it's more like with your example, it's more about you open your eyes to the opportunity or you open a door in your life and then something walks through the door. But the door's got to be open first, right? You've got to allow that to happen in your life before it can happen, right? If you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, like your opportunities, that publisher coming to you, you know, it's the same thing, isn't it? You've got to first open the door to allow that publisher to come in and you had already done that right rather than said yeah i want to have this thing manifest in my life right so yeah and i, I would think even that's kind say, of the first step yeah and i would even say like like my fiance he's had the same you, you know we had um he had worked in an, in the construction industry forever and just got to a point where he couldn't do it anymore just could not do it and um you know took it took a, a bit of time just to like reevaluate life and whatnot and then in that, we got a new dog, and um, he was taking our puppy at the time out for a walk, randomly met this this woman um, in the park, because our dog's really cute, and everybody's going to say their dog's the cutest, but my dog's really cute. Um, <laughs> you can see him on my Instagram. He's, uh, he's on there all the time. His name's Bliss, and he's super cute. But anyway, so Forrest was at the, my fancy Forrest was at the, park and I, I don't really remember now how it all came about but he met this woman and she was starting a dog walking company and so he was her first I think she oh you know I think she had um like a sign or something on her car or something like that whatever reason they ended up in a conversation um and then from that he ended up becoming a dog walker and has been walking dogs here all along Salt, Salt Lake City and is like the world's best dog walker because he takes them up. He picks them up like a school bus every day and brings them up. They walk in the mountains for um, over an hour and then he drops them all back off at their houses with uh, picture collages to each owner um, texted <laughs> to them when they get dropped off. Like I took a kid. For what a walk. service. Yeah. You know, it's great. Um, awesome. you, you know, and I think that that's another example of, when you open yourself up to different possibilities and he didn't know it. And it wasn't a fast thing either. It wasn't like, boom, he started working and had a ton of clients. Like it was like one or two and then it was like two or three. And now, um, his schedule's pretty much full. And, um, and it, so again, I think it's another example of just when you open yourself up, you just never know. Like what yeah. happened if you didn't engage that conversation that day? You know, exactly. You, just, you life would have been the same. It would have changed, right? I mean, change for the better, but you've got to open yourself to the opportunity. And I think a lot of people listening today will take some, you know, advice and some lesson from your story as well, Margaret. It's been a real inspiration. Yeah. I'd say talk to the person. If you're in, if you're on a plane, if you're in some random place and you end up next to somebody for a long enough time, have a conversation with them, take the earbud out. You never know. You could end up talking to, um, it, it could be a converse. You, you just don't know. You just don't know. It, it could be a total throwaway conversation. It never changes anything. But um, I know multiple people now that chance, circumstance, weird things happened and all of a sudden their lives changed. Sometimes, most of the time for the better, sometimes not so better. Most of the time for the better. <laughs> exactly. Hey, that's Margaret Schlachter, everybody. She is the editor of Mud Run Guide and founder of Dirt in Your Skirt a real inspiration, a challenger, explorer, conqueror, and let's say inspiration, explore, conquer, inspire. Go and check out her podcast. Go and check out dirtinyourskirt.com as well as Mud Run Guide, as well as Instagram, etc. We'll put all the details in the show notes. 
Margaret, thank you so much for coming on the show today and inspiring us with your story. Thanks so much, Graham. This has been great. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.